Amen, amen. Okay, so um, I'm going to go to a weird place to get us started uh, because this is going to kind of give us some of the why behind why we're doing 21 days of prayer and fasting. It's going to feel like a right turn, but just follow me through this, okay? I'm going to the book of Leviticus. I'm sorry, but I am. Uh, the book of Leviticus. Um, uh, so, sometimes it, if you've done a lot of Bible reading, Leviticus can be where all those Old Testament laws are, and, and, and maybe they intimidated you in the past, but this particular section is going to help us understand something I think really, really important. So this is the Feast of First Fruits, is what it's called. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 9 it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel when you enter the land I am giving you and you harvest its first crops. Bring the priest a bundle of grain from the first cutting of your grain harvest. Okay, bit to explain here. Um, this is one of seven feasts that were part of the Old Testament Jewish calendar. God gave them seven feasts to recognize every single year. And this particular feast, actually the first three, are right in the first month of the Jewish calendar. This is called the month of Nisan is when this took place. And so right in the first month of the Jewish calendar, which it began with Passover, because that's when God saved them. Their salvation became the beginning of their calendar. Does that make sense? Yes. God, was, God was making a statement about something. So the Passover was on Friday. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, Saturday. Sunday was the Feast of First Fruits. So if, if you uh, are a student of Jesus and of the Bible, you might draw some connections between the fact that Friday was the Passover and the Passover lamb was sacrificed. By the time you get to Sunday, it's resurrection day. And here come the first fruits. First Corinthians tells us that Jesus is the first fruits from the grave. Amen. Ooh, all kinds of fun stuff. So, all right. So um, you might be asking yourself this. Um, how could they be in March and they're doing a first fruits um, offering to God of their harvest? I don't really think of harvests until maybe August, September, right? This is an early crop. Um, so scholars tell us this is the barley harvest. Say barley harvest. Barley. So the barley matured in the calendar year the quickest. It's just the, the nature of the way that that plant is built. It, it matures around March. And so it would be, it, for a, a Jewish farmer, it was the first thing that would have been matured and ready to be either eaten or sold. And God comes in and says, of the barley harvest, I want you to bring that to me as an early first fruits offering. Verse 11, on the day after the Sabbath, the priest will lift it up before the Lord so it may be accepted on your behalf. On that same day, you must sacrifice a one-year-old lamb with no defects as a burnt offering to the Lord. No defects. No defects. Um, God is just coming in and saying, listen, the kind of offering that you bring to the Lord matters. Sometimes we bring God our leftovers. Sometimes we bring him our whatevers. He says, no, come and bring your best to the king. Because when you bring your best to the king, what you're doing in your worship is you're declaring him king. And that changes your heart. So it matters. Verse 13, with it, you must present a grain offering consisting of four quarts of choice flour moistened with olive oil. It will be a special gift, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. You must also offer one quart of wine as a liquid offering. Notice it says a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Does that mean God is into scented candles? No, right? It's not about the aroma. It's not about the smell. It's about the fact that um, he, will, he will use that. He'll say, as the sacrifices are burned and the, and the smoke goes up, it's a pleasing aroma. And then you come into the book of Revelation later, and he says, it's the prayers of the saints that are the pleasing aroma to the Lord in heaven. What it is, is it's hearts. God says, when you come and do this thing, I'm pleased by the hearts that I see. It's that act of worship. Verse 14, do not eat any bread or roasted grain or fresh kernels on that day until you bring, until you bring this offering to your God. This is a permanent law for you and it must be observed from generation to generation wherever you live. It's so important right here at the end. He said, listen, you might have harvested all your barley. 
You might have been tempted that, hey, the feast day is not here yet. Maybe we'll eat some of it before we get to that day. God says, no, you're going to hold it all until the sacrifice is made. God eats first. Yes. Right. And of course, he's not eating anything here. But there's something about making him first that he's protecting in the ceremony that's super important. And then I'm going to throw you over to Deuteronomy chapter 26. Now I'm jumping over into Deuteronomy chapter 26 because what we just read there in Leviticus, which is our main passage for today, what we just read there talked about this is how the ceremony works of the first fruits offering. But over here in Deuteronomy is a separate passage that talks about the prayer that you're meant to pray when you make the offering. And what you're going to see in the words of this prayer that God gives them, it's almost like he gives them the lyrics to the song that they're going to sing while they make the offering. There's so much in it. So Deuteronomy 26, you must then say in the presence of the Lord, when the Egyptians oppressed and humiliated us and put us into slavery, we cried out to the Lord. We heard, he, God, heard our cries and saw our hardship. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt. He brought us to this place and gave us this land. And now, O oh Lord, I have brought you the first portion of the harvest that you have given me from the ground. Amen. So what they're saying in the prayer as they make the offering is, God, you gave it to me. So I'm giving it back to you. Do you see ownership there? Mm -hmm. But also the bigger picture is, God, this is where I've come from. Like I came from this place where I was in Egypt and I was in a bad way and they had made me slaves. And then I prayed to you and I asked you to come and rescue. And then you came and you rescued me and you brought me to this new land. And now I'm in this new land where I've got crops that I can actually sacrifice. But the only reason I'm here with a gift to give is because you got me here. Do you hear your own testimony in those words? The only reason we give to God is because he first gave to us. We love because he first loved us. It's all his, amen? amen. It's all his. So what is that first offering? I'm gonna give you three things that I believe the act is, what it says. The first offering is number one, it is an act of ownership. Ownership. God, you own it all. And so here I am in January giving you the first month and the first harvest of all the harvest to come as a declaration that it all belongs to you in the first place. Amen. The second thing I'm saying is that it is an act of priority. I'm saying that God deserves first. I won't eat of it until he does because he deserves what's first in my life. And then it's an act of faith, and this is a big deal. And it's this act of faith that's really going to extend across into the rest of the message today. It's powerful. How do I know the other harvests are going to go well throughout the rest of the year? I don't. How do I know that disease might not hit my crops, that the weather might go bad? How do I know? What guarantees do I have that everything else is going to be rosy after I've sacrificed precious resources from my family to the Lord? You don't have that guarantee. And so what you do is you take a massive step of faith that God, as I give to you what's first, you will take care of the rest. Amen. And that's easy to talk about in theory, isn't it? But it's tough. Even as we give, there's, there's nobody in this room that gives to kingdom work out of their family's resources. Even if, you're, even if you're tithing, even if you're percentage giving, and you're giving out of your family income to kingdom resources, you've got other things you could spend that on, yes? And there's a part of you that's like, if I give that to the Lord, what, what happens if the rest doesn't work out? There's no guarantees. It's a step of faith. Amen. I make a statement that I believe God is good and that God will take care of me. We're walking in faith now. Faith is a big deal. Uh, sometimes we think the challenge of the Christian life is to walk in moral perfection. I would tell you it's not. The difficult thing about the Christian life is walking in faith. 
Faith takes way more strength. It's, it's way tougher. Uh, some, some of you guys really want to get into the manly, strong parts of the Christian life. I'd say walk in faith because it messes with you. It's one thing to believe in God. It's a very different thing to believe God, to believe God in your day-to-day life and actually act like you trust him. To act like you trust him, it's where the rubber meets the road. These folks were acting like they trusted God. When I was 18 or 19, um, I did something really silly that if Linda and I had been married at the time, she might not have let me do. But I did. I paid a lot of money to go and jump out of an airplane. (laughs) Some of you guys do that in order to serve your country. I just did it for fun. It was, it was a blast. And I mean, they spent all day training us how to do it. And I remember, you know, they, they have you climb out on the wing of the plane. I've described this before, but it was just such a moment for me. But you climb out on the wing of the plane and the coach is inside the plane, still safe. And he says, now let go. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I have to trust somebody packed this parachute right. My life is on the line. I mean, it's, It's a step of faith to be more serious. I remember when Linda and I were about to get engaged and I was seeking God on whether or not to pop the question. I had a season in there where I was struggling and filled with some fear. It had nothing to do with her. She's wonderful, amen? Linda Trueblood's wonderful. You can amen that louder. Yes, yes. But... I was struggling and the reason I was struggling and and it took me a while to understand it because God had to pull some layers back while I was praying and seeking his face about it. And he said, the reason you're struggling to make a commitment is because your parents divorced and you grew up in a home where the pain of that was evident. You don't want to do that to your own kids. And so your fear has got you in a place where you want a guarantee. You want a guarantee that if I marry this person, nothing will ever go wrong. Is marriage a guarantee that nothing will ever go wrong? Yeah, right? And I had to let go of fear and I had to trust the Lord with my marriage. It was tough. And did I trust him 100%? No, but I walked in trust. I walked in trust. Like that's, it's, it's one of the things that we get kind of screwed up about our, our New Year's resolutions, right? Like we make these New Year's resolutions and a lot of what it is, is it tends to be positive thinking about 12 months, the next 12 months of me and how great I'm going to be. And a lot of times those positive thoughts don't come to fruition, right? A lot of times they're, they're empty promises. Now, don't get me wrong. There's really good goal setting that we can do. That can be really healthy. There's something wonderful about a clean slate in January that God gives to us and we can come and we can set some really good goals. That can be a really positive thing for us. But there is something in the center of it that can be, if we're not careful, a lot about our performance. It can be a lot about us. Will we or won't we? And a lot of times we won't. First fruits is a, this beautiful thing of where we just walk in faith. We just take a step and God's going to take care of the rest. Amen? Amen. God's going to take care of the rest. Even seeking Jesus is a big step of faith to pray, to go into a room and say, I'm going to seek Jesus for 10 minutes. I'm going to talk to the savior. I'm not just going to be saved. I'm going to build a friendship with the Lord. I'm going to talk to him about what's going on in my life. And I'm going to hope that he talks back. And leads back. And there's a sense of conversation. There's a sense of relationship that starts to build in our lives. And that can be scary, amen? It's a step of faith. How's it a step of faith? Well, I'm trusting he's going to show up. I'm trusting that what might feel like weirdness, the first two or three quiet times that I have with the Lord, or maybe the first 50 times that I have with the Lord, who knows? That eventually that's going to change over into a friendship. It takes time. It takes time. And it's worth taking those steps of faith. Fasting is the same way. Paul says, I want to know 
God and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. You ever read that? I want to know God. He doesn't say, I want to know about God. He says, I want to know him. That's friendship. And that's what we should be pursuing. So um, another little right turn, because I just want to make a point to you about New Testament offerings. This is 1 Corinthians 16, 2. I just want you to see that this Old Testament principle, we're going to talk about that next week in the book of Acts, by the way. There are certain things that are descriptive in God's word, and there are certain things that are prescriptive in God's word. Um, This is one of those things that you can see that there's a principle from the Old Testament that God brings forward in a prescriptive way in the New Testament. So he says, on the first day of each week, you should put aside, you should each put aside a portion of the money that you have earned. Don't wait until I get there and then try to collect it all at once. This is the Apostle Paul talking. And he's talking to a group of Christians in a church. And he's saying, listen, I as an apostle, I need you guys to set aside some kingdom resources for some kingdom work. You need to give and you need to set aside a portion. That's a percentage of your income. But when you set it aside matters. He says, set it aside at the beginning of each week. Why would he say set it aside at the beginning of each week? Because maybe I'm a worker in the field and I get paid every single day by the farmer that's hired me. For me to set aside money money on a Monday, that's faith, yes? Because what if I lose my job before Friday? Or what if the bills are too much? Wouldn't you rather get all the money in and then know that there's enough there for God to get his peace? That'd feel easier. But he calls them to the same kind of faith. This is why I want you to see in the New Testament that we're called to in the Old Testament. There's a principle of first fruits here. Next, Philippians 3.18. Another right turn. This is Paul describing people who might be calling themselves Christians, but maybe on the inside, something else is going on. He says, for many of whom I have often told you, And now tell you, even with tears, they walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame with minds set on early things, earthly things. Uncomfortable topic. Sometimes we can talk a good game about Christianity and about God on the outside. But if you actually look at our life, Our functional God, our daily God, is somebody completely different. He says their God is their belly. That's weird. Right? What's that mean? Their belly, their stomach, their appetites, what they want, their temptations, the part of you that rises up and says, no, you have to give me this right now. See, many of us listen to that voice really, really well over the holidays, amen? And we're a few pounds heavier right now, right? Grandma only makes that once a year. I mean, that's good stuff, you know? And I could have stopped at one portion, but why, you know? I mean, we're all there. I totally get it. But Paul's coming in with a much bigger concept here and says, sometimes we're in a spot where we feel like we always have to say yes to our appetites, And when we always have to say yes to our appetites, it starts to take on a tone of obedience. Like I obey my stomach, right? Like like it's what I prioritize, even worship. Worship sounds like a really weird word, right? But if I make it number one, isn't that what I'm doing? And if I choose if I choose my appetites over what I know is healthy for me, there's a problem. And, it's, and, and Paul's just u- using this idea as like a bit of a wake-up call to us and said, you know, like if you say God is your God, are you walking that way? Because see, that's what fasting is all about. We haven't really gotten to fasting yet, but I'll just, I'll just tell you, that's what fasting is all about. It's about saying, no, my appetites are not who's in charge of me. That's the whole point. That's why we're going to do 21 days of prayer and fasting together. Jesus said it a different way. He said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, where, where your stuff, your resources, your money, your, your retirement, where all that stuff is, that's where your heart tends to be. What do you treasure 
the most. I heard one person say, your checkbook is an MRI to your soul. Yeah, this is where first service got quiet too. (laughs) Your browser history is an MRI to your soul. The screen time report on your phone is an MRI to your soul. There's things that we say about ourselves, but certain things speak the truth about what's really going on with us functionally every single day. And God wants to come in and he wants to fix that because he loves us. So do you have a belly-centered life? Do you have a career-centered life? Do you have a sex-centered life? Do you have a money-centered life? Do you have a children-centered life? See, nobody goes on the throne except God. And when anybody else is on the throne of your life, things start to go wrong. I don't mean that God gets mad. I mean, your life is now out of order and bad things start to happen. And we've all felt them before. So that's the tough news. The good news is that we want to walk in something different as a church. And so this 21 days of prayer and fasting that we're about to do is us basically saying, hey, come with us. We're going to try and do something different this January. And and if we do it together, maybe it's a little more clear, a little bit more fun, a little bit easier for us to try some of these hard things together. Does that make sense? 21 days. We're we're starting on the 21st of this month. 21 days of prayer and fasting. Why prayer and why fasting together? Here's why. Because prayer is where you turn up God's volume. Fasting is where you turn down the volume of the rest. I need the rest of this stuff to be quiet for a little bit so that God can be loud. I'm going to spend some time praying with him to try to hear his voice, strain to hear his voice. But all the other voices that I spent the whole last year listening to so much, I'm going to intentionally quiet them down. 21 days of prayer and fasting. We start at the 21st of this month. We go for three weeks. Some of you guys have done the studies. 21 days tends to be how long it takes to build a habit. Right? And so... What might God introduce into your life, first fruits, that might, you might find extending through the whole rest of the year will be done in early February. It is the day before Super Bowl. You're welcome. <laughs> Still a huge face step, right? But you'll be done in time for Super Bowl. <laughs> prayer and fasting. So let's talk about prayer first. Um, take you to a very simple verse. Um, And the rest of this message is really, it's just practical. How do you do this? Uh, How do you pray? How do you fast? Um, The first part, prayer. Uh, Jesus' example, verse 16, but but Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. So one of the most powerful things that motivates me to seek after Jesus in a friendship is a verse like this right here. It's the fact that Jesus himself prioritize just spending time with God the Father. And you're like, well, he was God. Didn't he have a direct line? Wasn't it easy? Didn't he just always feel like he was in the presence of the Father? Probably all that was true, but he had to silence the rest of the world too. And he had to get off alone into the wilderness. All these other disciples, all these questions, all these needs, he just had to get quiet. And it's just me and the Father Two members of the Trinity, try to figure that out. I can't, but they knew they had to be in fellowship. And then later on, Jesus said, it's, it's, it's almost like you got to stay plugged into this grapevine and you're one of the branches. And if you're one of the branches on this grapevine, if you're not plugged into that grapevine, you're not going to get any sap. Like there's no strength, there's no resource, there's no power. It's going to come into your life. If that relationship isn't strong, you have to be plugged in. So Jesus often withdrew by himself for private prayer. You're like, well, I go to church. I get it. And it's awesome. There's so much good that God does in a community like this. Amen. Amen. But there's something very special about just me and the Lord. I go into a quiet place with just him and just spend time with him. Here's a sample prayer for you to take a look at, because this was given to me when, when I was just starting out in my faith. It's the Acts prayer. Uh, the Acts prayer is adoration, confession, thanksgiving, thanksgiving and supplication. Um, it's just an easy way to remember what's, a, what's an easy structure for how to pray. 
Uh, supplication is a, a fancy word that just means these are the requests, these are the things that you're asking God for. And so I start by just coming in saying, Jesus, I think you're amazing because of this. And I, I tell him who he is and I worship with my words just for a minute. And then I start to confess my sins, right? And I tell him, God, these are the things that I'm sorry for. These are the things that I failed at. And I know I failed at. Would you forgive me for these things? And then Thanksgiving, I start getting really specific on thanking God for every good thing in my life. And I start listing all those things out to him. And then finally, God, here are my needs. Here are my fears, here are my struggles, here are my stresses. God, would you come in to all these places about me? The person who gave me this prayer to start with, they said, why don't you go into a closet for 10 minutes? Just give, give Jesus 10 minutes a day. And I was done with that prayer in about three minutes, and then I watched the clock for the remaining seven. It's okay, you have to start somewhere. All right? Don't get intimidated by it. Like you might have Christian friends at church and they're talking about how they spent hours, you know, in prayer with God. And, and you're like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm such a failure. It's like, don't, don't go there. Like realize you got to start somewhere. Realize Jesus loves you. Realize as you bring your offering of time to him, he is thrilled with you. I started with that 10 minutes and I remember when finally 10 minutes wasn't enough and it took a while for 10 minutes to not be enough. And then I remember when my prayer time got longer because I wanted it to be longer, not because I was trying to be a religious person. It just got longer. And then I remember when my time in prayer and talking to Christ, um, it started to go outside the bounds of that devotional time that I had set aside with him. And I, I found myself praying in the car just because it was natural to do so. And I found myself praying whenever I was on my own and, and the ongoing conversation with God all day long. The, the scripture talks about pray without ceasing. It just kind of evolved and it grew organically in my life. You don't have to rush it. Hopefully there's you can sense the grace in all of that for you today. Just get started. Amen. Just get started. 10 to 15 minutes. Do the Acts prayer. Um, next, fasting. Oh, boy, let's go. Matthew 6, 16. Jesus talking. He says, and when you fast. Say, when you fast. When you fast. When you fast. When you fast. When you Gosh, he just assumes it. He just assumes we're doing it. Do you see him? When you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do, for they try to look miserable, disheveled, so people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth, this is the only reward that they will ever get. So he also implies that there's rewards to fasting if we'll do it. But people who are making it all about spiritual pride and pats on the back from people in the church, he says that's all they'll get. So don't make this about spiritual pride. Don't walk around me like, man, it's so hard to be fasting like I am. You know what I mean? Just don't tell people. Keep it private. Amen. I'm going to say later on, you might want to bring one person in for some accountability, especially your spouse if you're married. Bring one close friend in. Let them know what you're doing just to encourage you. But don't tell everybody. But the big thing there is when you fast. When you fast. Wow. Okay, but I'll, I'll be real. Um, it was much later in my Christian life before I started fasting. This is something that a whole lot of folks don't talk about because it can seem weird, yes? Um, saying I'm gonna not eat uh, can seem weird. Um, we like to know exactly why something's going on before we do it, I get that, but there's some mystery to this. You got to notice what Jesus doesn't say in that passage. Like he tells you not to make a big deal out of it, but he does not say what kind of fast everybody should do. He doesn't dictate it. He doesn't say how often you should fast. He also doesn't tell you why necessarily you should fast. He just indicates to you that there's some kind of reward if you do. It sounds like a faith step. Again, a faith step. Will you just do this thing that I've asked you to do? Fasting. So even though I just told you Jesus doesn't tell us why to fast, I'm going to take some guesses as to why. 
So you can listen to this part or just sleep for the next three minutes um, if you'd like. Uh, next slide is fasting. Why do we do fasting? Um, here are three things that I have observed in my own experience. So I have observed these in my own experience. I am not guaranteeing that if you fast, these things will happen for you. You'll have to seek God on that. So the first thing that I've noticed will happen sometimes is that when I fast, sometimes I walk into a fast with a big question. God, I'm at a crossroads and I don't know which direction to go. Or God, I'm just absolutely lost at this section in my life with my parenting or whatever else. I just need an answer or clarity from you on something. And I'll go into the fast and sometimes by the end of that fast, God has given me that answer. Why? Because I quieted down the whole rest of the world and I turned up the volume on his voice. And you'll see that in the scripture, Jesus fasted before his ministry. The elders in Antioch in the book of Acts, we're going to read that later. Um, they fasted and prayed over Paul and Barnabas. And then God spoke to them and said, send these two guys on a missionary journey. The implication of the passage is that God spoke through the fasting. So for an answer, next is to need God more and everything else less. We need the things that we need, but we need God more. Amen, amen. And back to functionally, a lot of us functionally are not living like that's true. And there's something about when you fast and you say, I'm not going to eat. I only want to hear from God. You walk functionally in the truth. Jesus said it when he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Do you remember when the, the devil brought him some, some, some fresh baked bread and tried to tempt him with it? What did Jesus say? He says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so what did Jesus declare right there? He said, through my fasting, I understand absolutely crystal clear that I don't need food. You're like, well, medically, we do need food. I know, but you know what I'm saying. I don't have to obey every single appetite in my life. And that's what Jesus was declaring. What I really need. He's sorting his priorities. This is what I really need is God to speak. Next is to sharpen your no. This, this, is, a, this is one, again, I've just kind of experienced this in my own life. Um, the appetites in my life, the desires, the temptations in my life, especially those, those things that are destroying um, aspects of your life, your marriage, your family, um, addictive things, those appetites demand to be obeyed. And you feel often like you have to obey those voices in your life. Often it's the way that you talk. I had to sleep in this morning. I had to have a second portion. I had to lose my temper with this person because they drove me to it and I can only do so much. Or this sexual temptation came my way and I had to give into it. I used to talk to myself internally that way a lot. There's something about when you fast and your stomach starts to talk to you. It starts to tell you exactly how it feels. And the way my stomach sounds during a fast is how dare you not feed me right now? Do you, do you not know what time it is? How dare you let me feel this way? How dare you not bring your body the resources that it demands? How dare you? And to be in that conversation with my own stomach and to say, I refuse. It sharpens my no. All of a sudden, I find myself able to say no to things that I wasn't able to say no to before. Because as I walk in saying no to those desires, guess what? My no gets stronger and more powerful. It's all through Christ. right? But that's part of what he's building in me. By the time I get like a certain distance, a certain amount of time into a fast, I'm shocked at what I'm able to survive, right? And so later on, I remember the very first time 
that it was, a, it was a sexual temptation came along later after a fast. And I remember the Holy Spirit just coming in and, and, and I was replaying the same uh, speeches to myself that I always did. And it's like, well, I have to, God just understands. God just understands I have to give in to this. He's like, no, I don't. You said no to all this other stuff. Why can't you say no today? You can say no. Fasting helps us to understand that. So last bit, how do we fast? Just again, more practical stuff. How do we do it? Juice fast, partial fast, Daniel fast, soul fast. There's a lot of different kinds. What we're gonna uh, push you toward is you need to seek God across the next two weeks because you got two weeks before this begins. Two weeks from today, we start the 21st. Um, so pull out your programs if you would. There's actually a sheet in there. There's an insert. It's, it's cardstock. And there's a spot for you on there I'll just give you a second to pull that out. You don't have to fill that out today in the service. We're gonna send you home with that. But what I encourage you to do across the next two weeks is to seek God and say, what kind of fast, Lord, have you called me to? What kind of prayer commitment have you called me to? And I'd like you to write it down in those boxes. There's even a spot down there for specifics on how you're gonna schedule stuff or where you might be located. We're gonna do special services during the 21 days where we're gonna, we're gonna actually open up the sanctuary um, Monday through Friday, 6.30 to 8.30 so that you can come and do your quiet time here because it might be easier and lower distraction for you to do your quiet time here in this room than doing it at home with your kids running around. Right, So we're going to open up this space and several of you are going to come and you're going to do your prayer time here. So just write all that stuff down. Do not bring that back to me. I don't want it. I just want you to go through the act of writing it down because I think it'll solidify in your mind what your commitment is. You'll notice also on the back of that sheet, these different fasts are described there. So just briefly, juice fast is you're going to eat nothing except drink fruit juice, some vegetable juice as well. I've done that for 21 days straight, one time in my life. The reason I'm bringing that up is not to brag to you. The reason I'm bringing that up is because, number one, I don't want you to assume this is all we mean by fasting is completely without food for that entire time. But the second thing is if you do a fast like that, you need um, medical advice. Seriously, you need to get a hold of good books. You should be talking to your doctor. You should plan a fast like that very, very carefully. And you should come out of a fast like that very, very carefully, or you can hurt yourself. The, the one time that I did that, um, when the fast was over, I was so starved that I found some tortilla chips that were highly seasoned and it was a bad idea. It was just a bad, bad idea. I can tell you that. So come out carefully and slowly. Uh. Anyway, yeah. Um, second one. <laughs> second one. It's painful memory. Um, second one is a partial fast. Uh, partial fast would be partial as far as time. Uh, so God might call you to fast your lunches for the 21 days. Or maybe he calls you to fast one or two days a week during that three-week period. He'll just give you a period of time and you'll go forward in that. There's, what we're trying to say is there's multiple ways to do this. Even Daniel fast, you don't have to fast entirely from food. In a Daniel fast, you fast from meat and dairy and sugar primarily. You're, you're able to do vegetables and fruits and nuts and things like that. So that's all in Daniel chapter one. You can read about that and, and what's allowed there. And then the last one is a soul fast is what we call it, or a media fast, no screens. No screens, 21 days. Um, yeah. <laughs> this is, uh, it depends on the phase of life that you're in, what's going on with your kids. Um, some of you have special diets. This might be a, an option for you. Um, some of you might have a whole lot of food preparation that you've got to do already. I will just say this. If whatever fast you choose, you spend all your time fasting and cooking special recipes and special shopping, and you find yourself praying less, that's not the right one for you. It's not about not eating food. It's about being driven closer to Jesus. So if you're praying less, you're just dieting, and that's not what this is about. Uh, three final just pieces of advice. 
Don't set up for failure. Don't go in wide-eyed and commit too much. Really seek the Lord on where you're to begin. The very first fast I ever did, my lead pastor called me to it. I was on the, our church eldership at the time, and he asked us to fa- fast for an entire day. I thought I was going to die at the end. Um, it's, it's tough when you, I just warn you, it's tough when you first start. Uh, I think the next year he took us to two days and asked us to fast for two whole days. Um, start slow, let let God speak to you on that. Um, the other thing is uh, invite others in. I already said that. Uh, at least a close friend or a spouse. It'll help you with your commitment if one other person knows about it. It'll help you take it more seriously. Uh, then the third thing is don't let a mishap make you quit. Now I fasted one time and woke up on the second or third day and went to lunch and completely forgot I was on a fast. Halfway through the meal, I'm like, oh God, forgive me. <laughs> and then there's this little voice that comes in when you do that and says, well, I guess, you know, you've already ruined it, so give up the whole fast. Don't do that. Just ask God for his forgiveness. Amen. Just realize how gracious he is. Take in his cleansing and, and get back up and try again. Amen? Amen? And get going again. So don't let a mishap make you quit. Go ahead and stand if you would. Guys, thanks for doing this with us. I'm going to pray for you. Um, I'm going to pray for two groups of you. Uh, first off, there's, there's some of you that, that you're saved and you've not gotten to this relationship point with Jesus yet where you're walking with him and talking with him and he's talking back to you and, and he's just a thing in your life. I want you to get there. I'm praying for that. Amen. I'm praying for your first fast. I'm praying for that. I'm also praying for those of you in the room who you used to do all this stuff. You used to walk with Jesus in this way. You used to have a pocket of your time, a space of your day that was devoted to him and then life happened. And you got away from it. And you got out of the habit. God, 2024, man. We get a fresh, clean slate. Isn't that beautiful? And this 21 days is your opportunity to come back. So let's pray for that. Lord Jesus, just... Uh, it's only you, God. You're the, you're the only one that can draw us, Lord. This is a supernatural work. So, Lord, would you draw us to yourself? Would you draw us to prayer? Would you speak to us on what kind of fast we should do? And Lord, I pray, Lord, for the beginning of a new relationship where there's a friendship between us and you and it doesn't feel like religion. It doesn't feel like Sunday church anymore. It feels real. Oh, God, that you would do that all across this room. And God, for those of us that have tasted that and we miss it, Lord, we just, we're right here in this prayer time and we're saying to you, we miss it, God. Would you bring us back? We love you, Jesus, in Christ's name, amen.